Hello and welcome to this video in which we will use the discrete time Fourier transform to determine the output of a filter in response to its input. Uh, so we'll basically use the frequency response of the filter and we'll compute the Fourier transform of the input. Uh, we know that the Fourier transform of the output is the frequency response times the Fourier transform of the input and uh, that will give us uh, the output. We'll also use the relationship between uh, periodic signals uh, which have Fourier series coefficients and the corresponding representation of the discrete time Fourier transform. So um, let's get started. Uh, the idea is that we have a system, x of n is its input, and x of n is this periodic square wave. So it has a value of 1 for 4 samples and then a value of 0 for 4 samples and a value of 1 for 4 samples and a value of 0 for 4 samples. Okay, and to begin with, we'll assume that the system, which is represented by an impulse response h of n, or a corresponding frequency response, we'll assume that the system is an ideal low-pass filter with uh, a cutoff frequency of pi over 3. So you can see that the impulse or that the frequency response of the filter looks like this. It's 0 uh, between pi over 3 and uh, let's see that would be 5 pi over 3 here and non-zero between these values and it has a value of 1 when it's non-zero. Now again, because um, we are talking about discrete time signals, the Fourier transform is periodic. You can see that it repeats, this passband repeats uh, with a period of 2 pi. Okay, so what we want to do then is we first want to find the Fourier transform of x. We have the frequency response. From that we can compute the Fourier transform of y. Uh, which will just be the product of the Fourier transform of this guy and the frequency response, and then take the inverse Fourier transform to see what y looks like. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is we need to get a um, Fourier transform representation for x of n. In other words, we need to find x of e to the j omega. Now, um, because x is periodic, it will have discrete time Fourier series. And um, let's denote those discrete time Fourier series coefficients as c sub k. And uh, the relationship between the Fourier series coefficients and the actual frequency, uh, or I'm sorry, Fourier transform, is this x of e to the j omega is equal to the summation k going from minus infinity to infinity of 2 pi c sub k delta omega minus k omega 0 where omega 0 is the fundamental frequency of this wave, of the square wave, which is 2 pi over n. Okay, now this uses the fact that these Fourier series coefficients are periodic in k with period n. And so basically what we're doing is we're repeating the same pattern over and over again. If we plot this, which I have done, we get something that looks like this. So um, again, this is the magnitude of the Fourier transform of x. And you can see I have a delta function. This is omega down here. My uh, drawing program's having issues. This is omega. So at a value of omega is equal to zero, I have um, a delta function that has an amplitude of pi and then at a value of omega is equal to pi over 8 this is omega 0 I have another delta function which is somewhat smaller 
at a value of omega of 3 pi over 8, which is 3 omega 0. I have another delta function and so on. Okay. So um, it turns out that the C sub k's for the square wave that we're working with are e to the minus j 3 eighths pi times k sine k pi over 2 divided by sine k pi over 8. This is what the c sub k's are. So the value of or the magnitude of this delta function will be 2 pi times c sub 1 where I plug 1 in for k here and get a number. I actually don't know exactly what that number is but it's about the magnitude is about um, what 2.2, 2.1, something like that. Okay so again the idea here is that when x is periodic it's a uh, Fourier transform looks like this. It's a bunch of delta functions at integral multiples of the fundamental frequency. And uh, again, because a discrete time Fourier transform is periodic, you can see this pattern repeating every 2 pi. So I can look at this and say go from minus pi to pi, and I get a pattern, or I can go from 0 to 2 pi, but that pattern repeats every 2 pi. Okay, so that is the Fourier transform of x. Now to get the Fourier transform of y, well let's back up. Um, to get the Fourier transform of y, I'm going to multiply the Fourier transform of x by this frequency response here. And you can see that this frequency response is 1 between minus pi over 3 and pi over 3 and 0 until it repeats again. So if I go back to the Fourier transform of x, so uh, basically when I multiply this guy by the uh, frequency response that I have, uh, this delta function and this delta function will get multiplied by 0. So uh, these two guys will go away. And then again, since the pattern repeats, this guy and this guy go away and on forever and ever. Okay, so um, that gives me then this, uh, this plot for the Fourier transform of y. You can see that the two smaller delta functions between the larger ones are gone. Okay. Now, um, from this, I can go back and get, uh, get the time function, y sub n. Uh, I can do that by recognizing that these values here, uh, the magnitudes of these delta functions, still correspond to Fourier series coefficients. And um, from the Fourier series coefficients, then I can reconstruct y. And I've done that, and it looks like this. So this is y of n you can see that it's similar to the square wave in the sense that it uh, goes mostly positive when the square wave was 1 and it goes down close to 0 when the square wave was 0. But you'll notice that I've lost the corners. So this low pass filter has knocked off the corners for me, which may or may not be what I wanted to have it do. But anyway, um, this basically shows us how this works. Now suppose, let's see, did I write it down here? Uh, yeah. Well, suppose now that I want to have a non-ideal low-pass filter. Uh, ideal low-pass filters are difficult to work with because they're non-causal. Uh, a very simple uh, low-pass filter that you can build um, that is causal is one where the impulse response looks like this. It's one-fourth then 3 fourths raised to the n u of n. Okay, so this is basically a decaying exponential uh, impulse response. Looks something like this. Okay, and the corresponding 
uh, for a transform, which this has actually been computed in, a, in another video, is 1 fourth divided by 1 minus 3 fourths e to the minus j omega. And I've plotted the magnitude of this frequency response here. And you can see that it goes up to 1 for low frequencies, and then for higher frequencies it goes away. Uh, as with all discrete time Fourier transforms, it's periodic with period 2 pi. Okay, and so what I want to do now is take this h of e to the j omega, multiply it by x of e to the j omega, and that will give me the uh, Fourier transform of my output. And so when I did that, I got something that looked like this. So unlike the ideal low-pass filter, where these uh, middle uh, frequencies went away altogether, you can see that they're still there. And also unlike the ideal low-pass filter that left the fundamental frequencies unchanged, these fundamental frequencies have actually been decreased quite a bit. Okay. Um, and again, hopefully it's clear that, for example, what this guy actually is, the magnitude of this, is 2 pi. The 2 pi comes from the fact that when I take a Fourier series coefficient and turn it into a, um, a, a Fourier transform, uh, actually I should just multiply by pi. So it's pi times c sub k, this is my original Fourier series coefficient, in this case it was c sub 1, times h of e to the j omega 0, okay, where this h of uh, e to the j omega 0 I obtain by plugging in omega 0 here. Okay, in a similar fashion, uh, let's see, this guy here is c sub 3, so this has a magnitude of pi c sub 3 h of e to the j 3 omega 0. Okay, that's what this guy looks like. So again, just to make sure it's perfectly clear, the magnitudes of these impulse responses are given by my original uh, Fourier series coefficients for x multiplied by the frequency response of the system evaluated at uh, k omega 0. In this case, c or k was 1, so I had h of e to the j omega 0. In this case, k is 3, I have h of e to the j 3 omega 0. So that's how I'm getting these guys. Okay, so um, this is what the frequency, or the Fourier transform of Y looks like. If I now reconstruct this into a time domain signal, I get something that looks like this. And you'll notice that what basically happens, uh, if you'll allow me to connect the dots here, you have something that's sort of increasing exponentially, and then it decreases exponentially, and then it increases exponentially, and decreases exponentially. So, um, this is uh, the result that we get when we use a non-ideal low-pass filter. Instead of having just sinusoids left over, uh, we have um, things that sort of increase and decrease exponentially. So hopefully you found this useful. Again, the important concepts here are the relationship between the discrete time Fourier series and the discrete time Fourier transform and how to find the Fourier transform of the output of a system in terms of its uh, frequency response and the Fourier transform of the input. So hopefully this has been helpful and thanks for watching.